what is each good for? Well, we can divide our software into two categories for our business. We have differentiating software. Differentiating software makes your business more attractive to your customers, and it gives you some difference from your competitors. Then we have non-differentiating software. Non-differentiating software is very important because it's enabling technology for your business. Your business would not work without it, but it doesn't make your business any different from the one down the street. Now, if we look at operating systems, word processors, etc., these are all non-differentiating because everybody can get them and they all work pretty much the same. If we look at everything that Microsoft makes, everything that Microsoft makes is non-differentiating to your business because your competitor can buy it too. Everything that the open source movement makes is non-differentiating in the same way. So we take the differentiating software, the special sauce that makes our business competitive, and we do that in the contract paradigm and we hold it close, we keep it inside our company. But that is only 10% of the software that we have or need. The rest of our software is non-differentiating and it can be done retail, contract, or open source. I submit that open source works better because it doesn't have the huge overheads of the retail paradigm it does not have the risk of the contract paradigm. When you do something under contract or even with your own employee, but only for yourself, you have the burden of all of the cost and all of the risk of that development. So why not go open source with your non-differentiating software? And then you share the risk and the cost with other people, even your worst competitor can be your partner on that software because it's non-differentiating. Why is it then that the majority, I would say the majority of consumers still choose with regards to non-differentiating software, they go the proprietary route and the more expensive route than going open source when, as you said, there aren't many differences between one or the other? Well, let's not discount Microsoft, although they may have done things to convince us that they're the engine of evil. <laughs> They've done an adequate job of putting software in people's hands, a better job than anyone else. Okay, they were in the right place when the PC revolution started. They were in the right place to capitalize from IBM's mass marketing of the PC. And we have a sales job to do now to convince people that open source can fulfill their needs. We have, to a great extent, already done that sales job in business. Look at the web phenomenon. We are the dominant web server. Most servers are running Apache. Most of them have Linux under them. Indeed, if you even look at nonprofit projects like the Debian project, according to Netcraft, which does internet surveys, over one million websites have Debian systems behind them. So to a great extent, we've won this marketing thing and people don't realize it. The next step is the home. Okay, before we really get in the home to a great extent, we have to be able to solve grandma's needs. And, and you know who solves grandma's needs. Every time you go over to grandma's, you fix your PC for her, right? We've got to win the hearts and minds of those people. The sort of, we're a little more knowledgeable about PCs, but we're not power user sort of people. The Linux and open source world are not there yet. We have made great progress in the past couple of years with installers and ease of use, and we are getting there. So I think we'll see great strides in that, that area. And by the way, I do normally have to go to my mother's house to fix her PC, so you're right there. <laughs> Um, Bruce, I, I want to I get into the aspect of the capital side, capitalistic side of things, how open source can make money. Um, in, your, in your opinion, how does one really make money in open source? Well, 
go back to my rather long explanation of the three categories of software development and differentiating versus non-differentiating. One of the most important points there is that the major economic impact of software is the economic impact of the users of software, not the producers of software. For example, look at Amazon. They're a great example of a software-enabled business. They use tons of software. They create tons of software. They've contributed to Apache. They've contributed to other open source projects. They use Linux very extensively. However, their business is selling books, and they can afford to develop a great deal of software and share it with other companies because it's enabling software for their business. So I want to dispel one rumor here. We can support open source development without ever making a profit from anything directly connected with software. Instead, we make a profit from our open source using businesses, whether they sell books or wash cars. They use software these days. And those are the people who have a need for open source and who in many cases can't get what they want sometimes enter into collaborations on software, produce useful things, and give them to the world. So this dispels that myth. People can't afford to give the software away forever. In fact, we can because we're making money in other ways. The question then becomes, how can Red Hat make money? How can Novell make money? This is a harder question because the open source model actually works the very worst for the software distributor, the, the Linux distribution, because those businesses are essentially selling a product that everyone knows they can get for free. So what do those businesses sell? Well, they'll tell you first an integration service. We make the software better. We file off the bugs, et cetera. We do release management. Well, that's okay, except that Debian is a nonprofit project and does that extremely well, too. And, and indeed, Debian is now the number two Linux distribution. It is bigger than SUSE, at least according to Netcraft. Um, so it's not the integration service that's going to make them money. Is it service on the software? Well, I have to say, I think that Red Hat has fallen down on the service equation so far. And in response, we've seen a number of venture capital funded startups recently whose job is to service open source, like the old Linux care. Um, so I, I think that some people are still trying to make money from the service equation. And then there's what Eric Raymond used to call widget frosting, which is have a proprietary product that you sell along with your open source. And your open source is enabling for that proprietary product. Well, you know what? None of these businesses give me a great feeling. You're not going to make yourself incredibly wealthy with any one. However, you can make a living at them. A living, but not a killing. So I think we have to focus on can we support open source from the user community rather from the Red Hats and the Novells of the world? Because if you look back, that's where op open source was made. IBM came in late. Red Hat, Red Hat came in when Linux already was a bootable kernel. All of the rest came in later. Some of the companies you mentioned, Novell and HP and the like, do still believe that they can make real money uh, in what they do. Well, HP is going to make real money because HP sells hardware. And it's easy to copy software. All of the investment in software is in the design. But when you go to material things, we don't have that Star Trek replicator yet. Captain Picard used to walk up to the wall and he would say, T, Earl Grey, hot. 
and this cup of tea would be manufactured in front of him and the tea would be manufactured right in the cup and when we can make material goods that way then Hewlett Packard will have to look for another way to make money but until that date Hewlett Packard can make lots